My particular case, Eddie was a great influence on me, too, in terms of getting into the banjo. My dad bought a Eddie Peabody record, Mr. Favorites by Mr. Banjo himself, uh, when I was four years old, and I played that record forever. <laughs> and I still have it today. So uh, um, with that, we're going to start out, and I'm going to turn the microphone over to Johnny Thorson. Well, good evening, everybody. I'm uh, Johnny Thorson from the wilds of Western Canada, and it's uh, very nice to be with you down here. I knew Eddie from 1961 to 1970 and had the pleasure of playing on stage with him a few times. And uh, I've got to tell you one cute little story that I told George the other day about uh, Eddie and I when we were in Seattle. Uh, we were uh, driving downtown, and uh, Eddie, you know, he, he always liked to go somewhere pretty fast. He didn't like to waste any time. So... Uh, we were driving down, and there was fairly heavy traffic that day, and uh, so uh, Eddie's zigzagging in and out of traffic in downtown Seattle. Well, we got stopped by the police, and uh, sure enough, Eddie gets called back to the police car, and he's talking to the officers back there, and uh, it just so happened that he had done a benefit for the Seattle Police Department the previous year, and he'd been given an honorary membership in the Seattle Police Department by the chief. So uh, he showed this card that he got to the two officers, and they said, uh, all right, sir, you carry on your way, but please uh, just uh, keep it kind of cool when you're driving in the traffic down here. So that's my little story on Eddie, the, one of the many that I, I can relate to you. And uh, I'd like to do a song for you that... Uh, Eddie had recorded, I think it was back in the 1920s or 30s. It's a sort of a little novelty song called Piccolo Pete. I was 14, and we had just gotten a beautiful Vega number no. 9 for me from a local music store, an old banjo, and my uncle wrote to the company, Vega Company, about uh, what the banjo was, and they wrote back. What I didn't know is he included a little three-inch recorded tape of me for Bill Nelson and Paul Badger, the president, vice president up there. We got a letter back, and he said, You're, we, we can't tell you your banjo was made in 1928 or something, but... We took the liberty of uh, sending Buddy's tape to Eddie Peabody. This was a letter from the Vega Company. Now, Eddie's records were in the stores. His style was still very much alive. If you played banjo, that's, the, that's what was in your ear. If you said banjo, people thought Eddie Peabody. Not so much Earl Scruggs and everything today. All that wasn't out quite so much. There was Eddie Peabody. And all his banjo players played like that. We played in that style, the fast word melody style. He was the man. Well, it wasn't long after that we received a telegram at my house and it said, Dear Buddy, Uncle George, Andy, Mildred, and, and Buddy, I'll be playing at the Cleveland Yachting Club in Rocky River, Ohio and would love to meet you. November 15th, 16th, 17th. And um, I think it was. 
My dad, mom, I and Uncle George drove out. And we stayed at the house of a friend of his, George Weber, who was the vice president of uh, Star at Tool. And I discovered first that Eddie had wonderful friends, a legacy of friends for a whole lifetime. And I walked in, and there he was with his banjo, a god, somebody bigger than life. We played, got to play with him. The following year, I got a shot to go with Waring's Pennsylvanians and toured the country for two years with Fred Waring's Pennsylvanians. And Eddie Peabody had my itinerary and stayed in touch with me by letter. And every city that I went to, I'd get off the bus, Eddie's friends would come all over the country. They would come and meet me after the show. Eddie knew everybody. And I got to meet all the old banjo players in the catalogs, the most wonderful old friends, some of which I've maintained until today. And Eddie said, I mean, then the Vega Company um, sent me out, it was very cool, to incredible honor, to the Hollywood Palladium to play with Eddie in this Banjo Spectacular show. And we had rooms right across from each other at the Hollywood Plaza Hotel. And I remember, I thought, I have to really show him I'm conscientious. So I got up about 7.30 in the morning, took a shower, and I got my banjo out of the case. I put the mute on, and I was going to practice just across the hall so he could maybe hear me. But before I even got the banjo out of the case, there he was over there practicing. I heard him across the hallway playing already. So I put my robe on, and I opened the door, and I knocked. And he was fully dressed, crisp, ready to go, and there I am in my robe, this 15-year-old kid. And he had a, a cart, a big cart that he pushed around, and it had his stool, all his music arrangements, all his stuff in it. And as he's getting stuff together, I'm thumbing through his musical arrangements. And I remember he came over and grabbed me. He said, buddy, you crazy guy, get out of there. Come on, let's play something. So that, that first memory, I'm, I'm sitting on the bed in my robe playing with Eddie. And by this time, a group of guys came in. They're all gone now. But we're sitting around playing, and we're playing the tune Robert E. Lee and cranking it up. And Eddie's showing me strokes. I remember him saying, uh, you're being too fussy about the chords. Let me show you. So we're in the middle of playing Robert E. Lee, and the phone rings. There's Larry Kellens, Al Alphonse, Ken Farnsworth. We're all sitting around. The phone rings, and Eddie says, total silence. Rings again. He says, sorry, we just left town. <laughs> Isn't that cool? Anyway, could tell you a million. Eddie, I, I got to know Eddie just over those four years, but we corresponded a lot, and, and he was just an idol to me. And we are all beholden to Eddie for creating a style that we've been able to sort of extrapolate onto our own careers and make a living and have a great life. All of us are very, very grateful to Eddie. Anyway, um, a tune that he always opened his shows with, a fast and snappy one shot I've got to play every 20 years for a while to keep it together, was Sweet Sue. Do you remember that thing, Tom? I'll try. You remember it? My name is Dave Marty, and my experience with Eddie Peabody lasted 10 years. I met him through the courtesy of Georgette Twain, who I met in 1960, and she asked me one day, would you like to meet Eddie Peabody? And I said, is the Pope Catholic? <laughs> so she, she set up the meeting, and Eddie was playing in San Francisco at Bimbo's 365 Club. So I went down there, and 
uh, Eddie did his first show, and then he came out after the inter- just when the intermission started. He came to the table, and he at- took me back in his dressing room, and uh, there was a couple of other guys in the dressing room, so there was also a cot. I guess they would rest or whatever. His banjo was on the cot, and he's getting ready for his next show, and he says, well, pick up the banjo and play me a song. Well, he had never heard me play at that point, of course, and I was playing guitar tuning, some people say Chicago tuning at the time, and I had learned one song in plectrum tuning. So when he says, oh, pick up my banjo and play me a song, I said, okay. So I picked it up and I played my one song that I knew, which was Alexander's Ragtime Band, and he thought that was pretty good. Then he, uh, he was ready to go out of the dressing room, but before he did, he opened up his banjo case and he takes out this can of three-in-one oil and he takes the little top off and he puts the tip of the can over the fingerboard and he's squeezing up and down and all this oil's coming out and going onto the fingerboard and I'm looking like, whoa, what is going on here? And then he took a little rag and he sort of wiped it all over in the front and the back And I'm thinking, oh, what's going on here? So when I saw him play for the first time, I knew what it was for because he's slipping and sliding all over the place. Well, I started using three-in-one oil. (laughs) And one day about, um, oh, within a year after that, I took my banjo in to be refretted. And the fellow who was doing the refret job uh, the next day, I walked in, walked into the music store to see how the it was coming along. He says he was Spanish. He says, "Señor, come over here." He says, "What are you doing to this banjo?" He says, "This wood is full of oil." He says, "You can't do this. The frets will pop out." And I said, "But I got to have it because because of my style." He says, "You can't use it. You got to figure out something else." So he thought about it for a while. And he decided to put varathane on my fingerboard so I could use my oil or whatever it was. Well, I couldn't use oil anymore. So I started using Vaseline. (laughs) No pun intended. Well, (laughs) as it turns out, Vaseline has petroleum distillates in it. And and I didn't know this, so I'm using Vaseline for a few months, and all of a sudden, the back of my neck, the finish starts feeling tacky. My thumb was sticking to it. So I took it back to the music store, and and the same fella says, you can't use anything that's got petroleum in it. So I was sort of depressed for a while, and then I I saw this girl at at a banjo band picnic, and she was using cold cream. Where are these guys' minds? Yeah, cold cream is good. I still use it. It has no petroleum in it, and there's no reaction to the finish. But my biggest story is when I was moving down to Los Angeles in 1961, and I had just gotten my first Vox, and uh, I stopped over in Fresno. Eddie was playing at the Sheraton Motor Inn, and so I'm sitting in the show. He knew I was there because I left a message in his room. For, for him with the operator. He's doing a show, and halfway through the show, he says, well, tonight, folks, we have a young and up... I was 21. We have a young and upcoming banjo... That was just a few years ago. We have a, a young upcoming banjoist here in the audience, uh, Dave Marty. He says, Dave, how long will it take you to go get your banjo? Boom, bam, boom. I'm out and back in like a minute. So he invited me up to play, and that was my, the first time I ever played with him in his show and the last time I ever played in a show but I had a blast and I was nervous as all get out my hands were shaking and it was great so that's those are a couple of my memories one more though the banjo that I had just got had one skinny little aluminum rod in it and it was held up against the body inside with an aluminum bolt and every time I would try to tighten the neck the bolt would strip, and I, my neck was wobbly. I couldn't do anything. So after the show, I uh, invited Eddie over to my room, and I showed him the problem, and he took a look at it, and 
He says, I'll talk to Bill Nelson, who then was the president of Vega. Within a few months, Vega Voxes now had two rods, and they were not aluminum. So it could be that when I showed him what my problem was, uh, that might have been the start of having two rods in the neck, in the banjo. Uh, one more quick one. In uh, 1964, I was at the San Mateo County Fair, and I had called Eddie the day before and asked him if he would play my banjo in a show. And he said, well, bring it over, tell the guards, put it in my dressing room, and I'll take a look at it, and if, if it's okay, I'll play it. So I'm sitting in the audience, and I'm just hoping and praying that he's going to run out like he always does with my banjo. And sure enough, he, he's got my banjo in his hand, and he played the hell out of that banjo, and my banjo's never been the same since. <laughs> Neither have I. Anyway, I'm going to play a song that was written by a fellow named Neil Moray, who is the same fellow who wrote a song called Chloe. And this song is called Happy. My baby just said yes. Put my seatbelt on here. Debbie Schreier, and I grew up in a house where Eddie Peabody was a household word. I actually had the opportunity to meet Eddie when I was, I'm not sure how old, but he was doing family concerts for Ham's Beer Company, and my dad was a friend and fan of Eddie's, and he wanted to make sure his kids got to meet his hero. So he took us up to a concert, and I remember after the show how nice Eddie was, saying, Oh, Lowell, it's so nice to meet your family. And, and we just thought Eddie Peabody was the greatest. And I remember going out on the playground when, as kids do, playing um, My Dad's Better Than Your Dad. And I remember saying, well, my dad knows Eddie Peabody. <laughs> so, in fact, Dad, dad actually wrote um, Eddie Peabody's biography and um, taught me how to play some of Eddie's arrangements. So I'd like to play for you now Eddie's arrangement of the St. Louis Blues. Yeah, sure. Are you ready, folks? Yeah. Here we go.
Well, I'm Howard Shepherd. I'm from Manchester in England, and I've never met Eddie. <laughs> but uh, uh, I came across uh, Eddie's style of playing when he came over apparently around 1937, 38. I wasn't around then, but I came across these 78 labels that he recorded whilst he was in, uh, in London on the Columbia label. And uh, the only banjo playing style I'd seen, as a traditional banjo players in England used to play, mainly three note chords, and it's all three note banjos. And uh, I heard this, uh, this record, I thought, this is, this, this is me, I want to do some of this. So I had an old wind up 78 machine, and I'm winding and listening and winding and listening. Anyway, I thought, well, I'll just concentrate on one tune, let's see. And I thought, I know, I like the melody in F. I thought, I like that one, that's good. Well, it was three years before I realised Eddie was a tone up, so I've been playing melody in F in G for about three years. <laughs> that's right, that's true. And I used to say, if I had a piano back at me, I'd say, uh, melody in F, uh, in G. And they'd look at me as I was just mad. So then I realised then, of course, we were a tone up. So that's all my experience about Eddie. And uh, as far as we're concerned in England, uh, he's like the Messiah. I said to George, he's, <laughs> you know, he really, something special. He changed, uh, he changed the banjo world completely in, uh, in Britain, that's for sure. So I'm going to now play uh, Eddie's uh, Melody Naff of the Columbia label he recorded in London. <laughs> Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Sean Moises. I come from uh, Cambridge in England. And uh, I don't have a memory of Eddie Peabody because he passed away when I was six years old. But uh, my mum and dad and my sister started playing music when I was a small boy. And uh, for some reason, I, I wanted to play the banjo. And a friend of my father's had an LP of Eddie Peabody, which were rare in England. And it was the old 1955 LP, The Man with the Banjo. And between those tracks, I heard so much vitality, and I'm not sure why it appealed to a guy of 11 years old at the time, but it certainly changed my life. And uh, I'd also like to say that uh, the sound of the, the banjoline or the banjo with the mute arm was so sweet, it, uh, it really appealed to me. So that's the, that's the past. To the present, if you like Eddie Peabody, I've really encouraged you to visit a website that with the 
permission of George, I've set up called edipbody.com, which is a place where people can share their memories of Eddie Peabody. There's some pictures there and some very rare things. And keep the guy's memory alive because we owe so much to him. So this is what Eddie invented. This is his instrument. It's, uh, it's essentially an electric banjo, but it's got six strings. The third and the fourth string are doubled up, and the fourth string is tuned an octave. A little like a 12-string guitar. It has a very pretty sound. And I'd like to play the next song for some very dear friends of mine, and I think it's a beautiful song. It's called I'll See You in My Dreams. All right, that's all. Here we go. We'll play the last eight. One, two, oh, one, two, three, four. <laughs> days are long, twilight sings a song of the happiness that used to be. Soon my eyes will close, then I'll find repose, for in dreams you're always here with me. I'll see you in my dreams, hold you in my dreams Someone took you out of my arms Still I found the thrill of your charms Lips that once were mine Tender eyes that shine They were light my way tonight, I'll see you in my dreams. My lonely way tonight I'll see you in my dreams Well, thanks so much. It's such a pretty song. Right, we're going to wrap things up here. We're probably running a little over time. Uh, just a very, very quick story on this one. The St. Louis uh, Banjo Club has a the youth band here, which is run by Ginny, and um, an old friend of mine called Derek Channing helped get things rolling there. Derek was a great guy. He was also an English guy, and the first chap to, invent, um, to invite me over to the United States. A friend of his was a guy called Skip Rosenthal, who had bought a banjo from another guy that had retired. He used to play in Hollywood in the Art Mooney Orchestra, a guy called Eddie Collins. Well, Eddie Collins had bought this banjo from Eddie Peabody, and uh, dear old Skip gave this to me, and he said, um, share it around. Don't sell it, just share it around. So I'll do that. If anybody wants to come and try it, you're welcome to do that. So we had such a wonderful time here on stage, we're going to wrap things up. You can join in on this one. Here we go, then. Oh, ready, boys. Give you some of that days.
ladies and gentlemen. I want to thank you very, very much for this wonderful, wonderful tribute. <laughs> I got to shake each and every one of your hands. Honest to Pete, buddy, thank you. Dave, oh my gosh. You got a good left hand. <laughs> Howard, thanks for coming in. Thank you for setting in. And Sean, ladies and gentlemen, a couple of you have commented wouldn't it be great if your dad was here? For those who knew him, <laughs> he's here. And he's whispering words of encouragement to each and every one of you. Thank you for this beautiful tribute, and God bless you. <laughs>